for uh, ah, uh, yeah, right. See, I'm, I'm so loud. <coughs> So, uh, I think Achim is going to take a little nap now. So, after all the PowerPoint wars, um, which are unfortunate, but um, that's all that stuff is relevant, um, I'm going to show you uh, what I built, um, uh, or what we built. Uh, we built this application originally uh, about two years ago, one and a half years ago. Um, and the goal of this application, uh, this, ap this application came into life in the following, with the following story. Microsoft approached us and said, for Tech at US, and they said, well, we're going to have 16 talks, and we want to have one sample that covers it all. You have four weeks. And every single topic that they had on the list should have been should should be covered with uh, uh, that one sample, including scalability and all those things. That they wanted to have a simple sample, and it should all be based on shipping technologies. So there we were, and we were idiots, and we said yes. So we came out with, uh, and they said they said let it be a bookstore. So we sat down and we were thinking and thinking, and out came this very diagram. Um, and then we sat down and just did it. Ah and I implemented this, this entire application in about four weeks and then we needed to, I needed to have, we, uh, we needed to about uh, two, two and a half weeks to actually get the ins installation right. Um, it turns out the deployment is a huge part of that story, right? Developing these services was rather simple once we had the pattern figured out. Um, but getting the deployment right was a major nightmare. So we had four weeks for the entire functionality we produced. Uh, we didn't count lines, but we produced just about two megabytes of C, C Sharp code in, uh, in four weeks. That tells you how fast of a coder Akim and I are. Um, and of course, all of these were, most of these things were templates, so we were template, uh, templatized, so we could uh, uh, pro benefit from uh, uh, our templates, but um, it turns out, turned out the deployment was really hard. So what I'm going to show you in this first block of time, and probably putting a dent into the time after the break, is I'm going to give you a little trip around this application about, and if you have to see this application already somewhere, um, and that must have been another presentation that I did, because the application was never published for reasons that are too complicated to explain. Um, I, we have now upgraded this to .NET 2.0 and um, I can't give it to you. Um, but I will try in my new job to convince the powers to make this application or something similar available to you. Okay, that's, that's all I can tell you right now. Um, I just gave to uh, Elias um, the thing that I did yesterday at the architect um, um, at the architect user group, architect C sharp user group common meeting that we had yesterday here, um, where I built a little skeleton application which happens to implement the same set of patterns that I'm going to explain to you now. So instead of coding this twice, um, I thought, well, let's code this once. Uh, for everybody, so the C sharp people got the whole uh, Clements codes it all life experience, and you're going to get the uh, now. Let's look at the app experience, uh, which is going to be a little richer in terms of uh, seeing patterns, seeing features, and seeing things implemented that that we've been talking about. Um, things about serialization, things about contract, things about <coughs> schema, and how to how this actually is realized in an application. So this is the big plan here, and we've been talking about this, and you've seen this little piece where Achim was talking about federators, and this little piece where Achim was talking about federators. I've been already telling you about communication patterns using this uh, using this example. The this this was the original application that we built, right? This was the result of the four weeks. 
Then we presented this to Microsoft, and Microsoft uh, and the guys at Microsoft couldn't look at this app, funnily, because we didn't that get the contract in time. That, this is how it, ha how it happens when you work with a big company, right? Especially with Microsoft. You have people who are responsible talking to you, right? And of course, if there's no contract in place, and the Microsoft legal, it took them a long time to get a come around with a contract, unless there's a contract, they can't look at your code. Because if it turns out that the contract falls, falls apart, right? There's no contract. And they've been looking at your code, and all of a sudden they're doing something similar, what you've been doing in your code, an evil company could then go around and uh, sue Microsoft and accuse them of theft, right? There's little risk that we, as good friends that we are, would do that. But then again, <coughs> companies amongst each other have no trust. And, and it's good that way. Because roles may change, and in the end, someone evil may take over the intelligence and then try to sue Microsoft. Right? And that's something that's unacceptable. So we threw all this stuff at Microsoft, and they said, Oh my god, this is way too complicated. Our customers will never understand this. All right? So we went and said, okay, we're going to simplify this into this model, which is the exact same thing. We're just taking out all the sophisticated services. So, for instance, this customer service here, right, is the exact same service as that one, as the partition. It's just additional services that we put on top of this. So here, this is a caching service, and this is the, the federator service, which uh, allocates the buckets based on, on, hash, on hash values. Then if we look back here, here we have the, the inventory service. The inventory service is the exact same one as one of the leaves here, right? It's just that we have, don't have this, uh, this federation service in the middle, which dispatches based on zip code. We still have all of those components, we just, uh, we just didn't put them into the application. And this catalog service here, right, is the same one as, oops, well, as this catalog service, so we just took out this website catalog service. The great thing is that the, this, these contracts here are all the same. So any client would never know whether it talks to this one or to this one. And any clients of the customer service would never know whether it talks to that, to that, or to that. So we were using, we were benefiting immediately from the way how service-oriented oriented applications are loosely coupled, and that we could actually plug in a different service. And it took us, when, when the Microsoft people came and said, no, 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 we can't, we can't use this, it took us about a day to rewire the application, and we're done. Right? And if we wanted to make this scale up, we just drop in the additional services, which I haven't ported yet, um, and then make the application scale out and do all those things. So we have been benefiting from, from those principles too. Another note before I jump into the, into the code, we've been also benefiting greatly from the principles of, of, of autonomy in, in two ways. First of all, the autonomy, autonomous teams property. Um, we have built this application based on principles of autonomous computing, <coughs> just as much as on principles of autonomous <coughs> contract. As you'll see here, we have a bunch of databases, and they're all real. Right? In my, in my let's let's look at my um, my SQL server management studio, which might <coughs> now connect, and it might not, because it all depends whether whether my Kerberos token for the database is still good. If it says no, I can't show you. It says yes. So the interesting <laughs> thing with, with SQL Server is that it uses Kerberos, right? And uh, if you are working offline, I'm working offline for my domain now, and my, my Kerberos session, uh, session token, session ticket for SQL Server expires on me, I can't access my local SQL Server database anymore. <laughs> So if you get cannot create SSPI context ever, if you've ever seen that on your machines, that is because your session token for Kerberos for your local SQL Server expired. You can fix that. You can fix that very that very bug or bug that very problem by logging in to your local domain via VPN, re-login to SQL Server, and there you have a new cached Kerberos token. 
see little tricks you find. This, this is why it's relevant that I talked about the code. So here's the, the customer's database, the inventory, inventory statistics database, the master catalog, order archive, pending order, site inventory, all separate databases. So we took ourselves seriously here, right? Things that I can talk to you about in terms of autonomy, of autonomy we're doing this. We're living what we preach. So all these databases here are actually for real. Every, of the, every single one of those services has its own isolated database, which was a great benefit of building the system. The great benefit of building the system was that Achim could shape the data model of his services exactly as he liked to. I could shape the, the database of my service exactly as I liked to. We didn't have any conflicts in, in any shape, way, or form. I could optimize. I could actually add the, the errors that I wanted in the database. Right? There are intentionally some indexes missing in the databases, so the database would occasionally deadlock. That's an important thing for this demo, but I'm going to get to that point. Um, also, autonomy, autonomy in terms of contract. I've been building my own contracts and my own schemas, and Achim's been building his own things. Since I was developing this thing mostly on the road, and Achim was uh, developing this either at home or at work, um, we had little, very little time to actually sit there and, and eat, A, synchronize all the data, and be, because you know source control is a good thing, but if if you never get connectivity to home, then that's that doesn't help you much. So we had little time to synchronize. So we were working on different paths and different versions, and we could still make those things collaborate because they were loosely coupled. Um, so it, it proved to us that, that distributed development. We knew that before, but because we've done that. But again, it proved to us that distributed development is greatly aided by autonomous computing principles and also by the whole loosely coupledness of web services. So, given that, let's look at the project. I have here the core services. Um, it's 21 projects in this solution, the total amount of projects in this entire thing uh, with the bigger services is, I believe, 53. So it's 53 different assemblies that we have. Uh, that's a lot for roughly seven weeks with two guys. Um, and uh, I've ported this from the .NET Framework 1.1 to 2.0 with a lot of restructuring in about a week. Um, it's, I wouldn't say I'm done because I haven't, I haven't been able to, to run any full tests, but at least it uh, compiles fully and passes most tests. Okay. You know, that's, that's one of those, we have one junior programmer on the team who still thinks it's compile ship. Compile ship done. So, we're going to look at the catalog service. The catalog service is a simple, is a rather simple service which is, which serves to manage a catalog of books. So, uh, and uh, for all you guys in the back, I will help you a little bit by, by, <laughs> making that structure a little bigger for you, okay? I'm going to close this once I'm getting to the code, but I just want to explain the structure to you. Every single one of those projects <coughs> has the same, same structure. First of all, I'm using assembly, so these are all class libraries. Every service has its own class libraries. I could theoretically split them up into multiple class libraries, and I probably would um, if, uh, if the project got a little bigger, but right now it's, it's single class libraries. In real life, you would never have a project that looks like this, right? Where you have the entire solution, the entire thing in one view, but you have rather autonomous, de autonomous development teams or autonomous developers and each care, takes care of one service. I've done this here purely to, to make, it, make it easy to demonstrate. If we look at the file structure, so here's the catalog service. The file structure looks like this. Um, so, as you can see, here's still the upper, upgrade, upgrade report files. Um, I have, uh, here's the catalog project, and in the catalog project there's actually a solution file. This would be the one, and you see this is not ported yet, so I'm in the middle of it. 
Um, this is the this is the solution file for that particular service, which contains the assembly that we're looking at. But also can, contains, for instance, the uh, the production installer, an installer file, and contains uh, an installer, and contains also a web service, and that's for IIS, and contains the database setup, all the database setup files that we need. So these are the bulk import export, this is the sample data, and all those things. So um, this is sort of the way one developer would look at this, would look at the individual service. This is their, their space. The greater solution is really for demonstration purposes here, uh, but that's not what you would typically see in a project like this. So the individual service <coughs> um, is structured in a way that I am creating some subdirectories, and I have multiple variations of um, project structures, but there's a few commonalities that I always have. The main namespace <clears throat> for all classes is, of course, the name of this assembly. I'm using project name dot and then subservice for uh, the assembly names. Um, you would probably use your, your company name or anything like this, and that's a good practice to do so. Uh, you see the assembly names that Microsoft is using, system dot for everything that belongs straight into the .NET framework and you see Microsoft dot for everything that belongs to Microsoft products. Um, if your company name is uh, ABC, you would call everything ABC dot. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm calling it all Prosware. Pro, Prosware is an imaginary company. That's a bookstore, and that's what I'm calling it like this. In, so we have a catalog service. Inside the catalog service is a subdirectory uh, that's physical and also conceptual with contract. Contract is everything that is about sending data in and out. It, it's about messages and operations. All message and operation definitions go there. This is the contract directory where I'm storing the metadata equivalent of wisdom. Of course, being a C-sharp programmer or a VP programmer, right? I hate seeing angle brackets. Just like Jubal Lovi, who also hates angle brackets, we both share our passion for not wanting to see any angle brackets in any program if we can just avoid it. So contract has the, the metadata equivalent of angle brackets. We'll see how that looks. Data contains everything that is common data types for that particular purpose over which I have definition authority. That's a big thing to say. It sounds good, right? It doesn't mean anything to you at the moment, uh, but it sounds good. These contains all data types which are used for my application, which are also useful for others, over, over which I have the definition authority. Meaning, if I'm writing the catalog service, I define how a book looks. Right? That's my job. In the bigger project, I'm the catalog guy. So everything has to do with catalog, all the data types are mine. This is where they go in, the in, this, in this data namespace. We will be able, and as you'll see, to export them for general use by someone else. We'll, we'll create schema for this. So if anybody has ever to do anything with a catalog item, that's where they can get them. We have ES that stands for Enterprise Services because we're going to use Enterprise Services in this uh, whole application. We have internal. This is where all of our internal implementation goes. This is where the business logic lives. And business logic is, there's a layer thing, right? There's an edge, as we've told you. And then below the edge is all the internals. And I'm hiding the internals. I'm pl putting the internals into a special place, which is called internal. And internal is everything that nobody else shall see outside of the app. So here's where my business logic lives. And then we have providers, and providers is everything that is ex has to do with external resources. That may be external web services, and that may be databases. They're all hidden behind a provider model, and I'm using the provider model for both web services or any, anything else, and database access, and anything that's external to my service. And lastly, I have a WS directory, and that's for web services. So. And then I have a couple of other things that I'm going to go and explain as I go through those things. Let's start with the data. I'm going to exit this. I'm going to start showing you code. 
I will try exit this. It's a little difficult. So, yep. Let's start with the data. Data is about making data accessible to others, right? There's multiple ways to represent data, with XML being one of them. There's, there's good reasons to use XSD and schema and all those things. However, it turns out that if you start writing schema by hand, you can create a lot of things, a lot of data types in schema directly that are not representable in any programming language whatsoever. You can create simple, you can create a simple type that is you know, percentage and has a range from 0 to 100 and all those wonderful things in XML. Schema will do this just fine, but there's no equivalent to a percentage in a programming language like VB or C Sharp. You can build a class to do that, but there's no built-in type support. There's no, and, and more importantly, there's no built-in type support for this in a language like JavaScript. And there, it's really difficult to build those types. There's other languages which have, which just have the commonly used types. They have an integer, and that's what you live with. So, what we need to, we, even though we can express the world in, in schema, we need to find a way to to express data in the most interoperable, most toler tolerant way that we find. And it turns out that schema is a language that's very, very complicated. So instead of starting in schema and starting differently, what I'm doing here is I'm creating plain classes. So, and now let me change the, the, the font because I've been messing up my settings yesterday during the presentation. I didn't hear, I didn't listen to Jackie Goldstein, which I should have done. And I probably have to do this again. Oh, not Courier, uh, Consolas. Consolas is a very cool font. There we go. Isn't that cute? If you have a copy of Vista, right, Vista Beta, go to the fonts folder, or if you know someone, <laughs> if you if you know if you know someone who has who has a Vista beta, ask them to take the Consolas font, right? Copy them out and install it into XP. Consolas is the new monospaced font which is super optimized for clear type, and that is the best font in the world for coding. It is absolutely brilliant. It's the end of Lucida console. This is this is a very very cool font that's coming with Vista, and it works on XP too. Um, so get it out of the beta. It's very, as you can see, it's very clean. It's wonderful. It's a great font. So I have a class. I have created a class author here, um, and this class this class author represents an author. It's just a plain old normal class. It has. Multiple extra properties. First of all, it's serializable. Because I want to be able to use this with the binary formatter of .NET. Because I want to be able to use remoting, I want to be able to use enterprise services, I want to be able to use the ASP.NET state service, I want to be able to use all those things that depend on the binary formatter. Therefore, it must be serializable. Second of all, I want this to be an XML data type that I can uniquely identify. For that, I need to have a schema compatible definition which makes this an XML, a global XML element alongside with being a global XML complex type within my schema. This is what this accomplishes here. Okay? Furthermore, I have here a name, right? This automatically translates into uh, an XML element. The binary formatter will actually serialize this, the, those private fields and ignore the properties. And uh, it will serialize out the name. It will serialize out, for instance, the author identifier. And then I have, oh, I don't have them on this class, see? I'm still not done yet, so I have them with catalog item. Let me look at that. Oh, I need to go to the bottom of this file and fix something. Ah, so it's up there. Fine. Good. Why do you have two namespaces at the same top? 
Oh, here? No, no. Uh, X, XML root. Ah, XML type. It's XML type and XML root. XML. I will show you. I will show you in a moment what what that's causing. Uh, let me just look into my properties here while I'm actually exporting this. Phones. I should be. And I do indeed do that. Let me just. One sec. Yes, I'm doing that. Okay. Just wanted to check whether I'm, whether I'm actually doing this. So, um, so here I have another class that, and all of those classes follow the same pattern. They're always serializable. They always are XML type and XML root, and they have a namespace declaration. That's the important thing. This is this is causing schema to be generated. I'm doing this automatically, sort of as part of my build process, and putting this into my output directory. And from there, I'm actually copying them out into a common schema repository. So let's look at the schemas. Here's schema zero. And that turns out to be just the schema that I'm emitting, that, I, that we're just looking at. There's catalog items. Here's the catalog item, right? This has the ex those exact types. So instead of going and defining XML schema in XML schema language, I'm defining XML schema by ways of using C sharp and attributes. Because it turns out that that's the safest way to define schema that's interoperable. Because I can't go, I can't, I'm, not, I'm not tempted to use attributes. I'm not tempted to use um, group constructs. I'm not tempted to use group attribute groups. I'm not tempted to uh, use any wacky uh, things, any wacky restrictions that, I, that are just hard to represent in, in, in other languages. Excellent. Schema for interoperability, schema for web services is not the place to be aesthetic about how the way, uh, the way your XML looks, right? It doesn't matter whether anything is an element or an attribute in all reality. You can, you can, philosoph you can be philosophic all day about whether an ID shall be an element or an attribute. It, it, is, it is clear that it's more interoperable, it's easier to program if everything is an element. So you can make everything attributes or can ma make everything element, and it turns out that the industry is converging on the fact that everything is simply elements because it's simpler to program against them. So here, consequently, everything is an element. So, if you have an XML service, it doesn't matter. It's a matter of putting the right attribute, XML element or XML attribute. Exactly, and that's, that's, and that's why I'm starting with this. Right? So I have a, so from this data namespace where I'm defining all the types that I'm concerned about in this, in for the catalog data, they go all here, and they all follow the same rules. Here's the catalog item summary, which is a short description of a catalog item. Private fields, and here I have all the identifiers. And mind that I have a different representation of my internal data as opposed to the to the outside data. For the zero byte, so all these fields here are serializable. This is what the binary formatter sees, right? Except those two last fields, which are explicitly non-serialized because it can't handle XML. So the binary formatter would see this. However, for XML, it is not very wise to put a GUID on the wire because that's intrinsically binary type. It should be really be URI. So I make this XML ignore and saying, no, no, we're not showing GUIDs to, to XML, but instead, we're showing an item identifier XML, that's a special property that I'm just building for this purpose, which I'm putting into the XML as item identifier, so this here is really the stand-in for that, right? This has the same name, this is getting ignored, this is the outside view, and this here is then properly turned into a URI, because the data type for that is really any URI. This is how I'm creating, I'm creating a proper XML identifier type from my internal GUI type. So there's an inside view of the application, which is all binary and objects and all that. There's an external view of the application, which is all 
URIs and XML and, and, and a proper way to, to represent those things. I think they have fixed it. They have given you attributes. Just expose the good and they don't do that instead of us having to code that. Wouldn't that wouldn't wouldn't that steal all the fun? No. 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 Wouldn't. All right. Um, are they going to fix it? I don't know. Write me email when I work for Microsoft. That I can probably give you an answer on that. Probably, I, I probably I can I can submit a design change request for you. We'll see. I will have great powers when I work there. Would I be able I to say I no? Think. Huh? Would be able to say no? I will also be able to say no. It's <laughs> an interesting feature. It will yes. be added sometime in the future. No, I can say that's great feedback. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that means, right? Did yeah. I say that yesterday? Yeah. Did I explain that yesterday? Okay. Yeah. So, and here I have multiple types, as you can see. This here is the is the equivalent of saying decimal question mark. I just love make, making things matters more complicated. So this becomes a null, it's a nullable decimal. So here I have all those types, right? And publisher and an array of authors, and that's all fine, right? I can make arrays and all those things. And then I have two special elements, which are a pattern that I really use in every single data structure. And and I still need to make things a little more consistent in this app because I've used this was the first thing I changed, and uh, this pattern gets more and more sophisticated as as we as we go through. Um, uh, and then I'm grouping this and then I'm putting this into a region, so I need to go and port backport my insights as I was porting this in this week. Um, this here is a standard pattern that's always everywhere, which has a special extra place for excess data that someone sends me. This is this is the key to to uh, loose coupling. I showed you this when I talked about contract, right? This is the any element. The additional element, that's where that goes. So all excess data goes into this array automatically. And if I send the structure back, even if this structure doesn't know any extensions of future version, it will automatically carry that data. It will also serialize that data back out to the wire. So let's see, let's say, what is this? Um, this is a, a catalog item, a right, catalog item summary. And this has um, a few arrays, let's see. This has a publisher, and it has an image, and it has sales rank. I believe it has an author's array too, right? Author's array here. Let, let's assume I would want to add an array with um, ratings, or an array with um, external reviews, right? URLs where I can find, where I can go and see external reviews for uh, for the book on, on the web. I can be adding this to a later version, to a later version of this, this data structure at some point in the future. If this version will see that data structure and reads it off the wire, all the external ratings elements go into this any array. Right? Because they're not unknown. However, if I serialize this out again, this structure with stuff sitting in XML elements, then the new elements, the new unknown elements will find their way onto the wire in the exact form as I read them. So it preserves the additional data. And that's, that's the magic that this element does. If you had additional attributes, if you find, even though I'm not using attributes, but someone may be giving me attributes as sort of a cookie or whatever, um, I'm also, I'm also retaining them using the XML any attribute thing. So XML is extensible so that everybody can, can add stuff and, and that sort of extensibility I'm, I'm providing on every class, every single thing that I do, every data structure gets these two, these two constructs so that I'm maximum flexible and, max, and I, expect, I, I accept everything. So, so looking at these data structures is more like Please give me data, and there's some, there are some things that I'm going to recognize, but you can give me whatever you like. And I'm going to give you back everything you gave me if, we, if, if there's a round tripping happening. 
right? It's a very open, very flexible thing that you do by introducing those arrays. Wouldn't you expect that a new, uh, a new <coughs> of, a, of a customer would be in another namespace, no. XML namespace? No, exactly not. I, so the question was, uh, would you, wouldn't you expect a new version of the customer to be in a different namespace? And the answer is no, I would not. I think it should be an evolution of the existing one. No, it should not. No, it doesn't inherit the, the. It doesn't inherit the class. You check out the class from source control. You insert a new property right there, and you check it back in. Where do you specify the version? Where do you specify the version? I would expect you to have some kind of field that specifies the version. Um, you don't have to specify the version. It doesn't need to be, it does, you can put it into schema if you like to. There's a way to control the version number on the schema. But that's, you, you can, you don't have to. Well, there's one, there's one thing, there's one thing you can add. See, you're all control freaks, right? You don't have to specify the version. You, you are publishing a new service and that new service accepts another field. But there's no reason that you need to know externally which version that is. It'll just work with all the other versions. It'll just it'll just be it'll just be wiser about one field if you want to enforce a specific order on those elements, right? Then you can, and this is a either or thing. Either you start doing this, or you let it go, uh, let it be. You can't mix those two models. You can go and you can say order equals five. So this forces this field to be the fifth element in the sequence. So you can have them in any order in your in your in your um, in your class, but you can mandate the order as they occur in schema using this order element. But the the basic the basic idea is here that you really go see this is under source control, so I can't really touch it. Um, the basic idea here is that you come in you come in with five fields in version one one. You come in with six fields in version one two, and since the, the additional access field is, is is covered by this any field, right? As you round trip, you're going to send this field unedited back to who gave you that. If you are, if let's so let's 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 take this let's take the let's take a simpler structure for an example. Let's take the author, okay? Author has, has a name and author identifiers, simply enough, right? Nothing more. Um, let's say we want to add a first name to the author, right? We want to split name and first name. We've been stupid in making this one name. Um, I would be adding, I would be adding the first, I would be adding the first name field. Or no, let's let's take let's take something else. So name is name is stupid. Let's take. Um, Nationality. That's also stupid, but let's take that. Or language. Language is good. Let's take language that the writer usually writes. In, okay. Um, and now let's talk about the client and server versions. I'm building the 1.2 version of this app. Okay. Client first. I'm adding the uh, the language field. I'm taking the new application and saying name language and I'm inserting it. So I'm saying okay. The older server will happily take this package, but it won't store the language. And such is life. Right? That's so. You could go and knowing this because you're already on a newer on a, on a newer version, you could say Okay, you can have an information service sitting on the server and say, what, what are the capabilities of those services and can they actually store this data? The server could also go, and that would not be an, an unwise thing, and take the contents of this any element here, as it stands, serialize this out into, simply into XML text, and just simply stuff this into the database. So you're not losing all that data. Right? And then you could convert it in an upgrade process and add this to the proper database fields if you like to. Now the case of the 1.1 client and the 1.2 server, right? 1.1 client only sets those two fields. The server has author, 
name, expects name and language. Language doesn't arrive because the client doesn't know it. In that case, the service makes a reasonable assumption about the language, and that being language neutral, or um, the imperialist assumption of being English US, or the local assumption of being we will have more Hebrew books in our database than, than, uh, than English language books. Right? You just take a reasonable default. And reasonable default is, is, the, is also a matter of service orientation. Service orientation is, 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 is a programming style which is about easy. Right? Easy being, being not so hard-nosed about getting data, being not so hard-nosed about you, know, you must give me this field, but rather be a little relaxed and say, all right, if you don't give me that data, I'm going to assume something for you. And that's okay. And if you can follow this, if you can work with optional fields more than with mandatory fields, that's fine. If, you, if, you have, if you're introducing into a data structure a mandatory field, that is okay. But then make that data structure a new data structure and change the operation that's using this data structure to a different operation because you're apparently introducing new semantics which are different from the semantics that you had in your previous operation. We're going to get to operations in a little, in a little while. So these are all the data, the data elements, and they look, alike, they look alike across the entire app. Always this extension field, XML any, any element, XML any attribute, and you always extend data types at the bottom, but you extend those very types. No inheritance. There's nothing has ever a base class. Everything that goes, everything that's data, that's, 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 that's for the wire, is just data types. You can put some, some validation logic in there. There's no problem, that's, there's nothing bad with that. Right? It's all good. However, um, there should be no inheritance in this. Because in real reality, as much as we love objects, for business objects, inheritance makes very, very, very little sense. You can solve everything you can solve for aggregation uh, that you can do for inheritance. The most common stupidity that, sorry, that I see is to inherit customer from person. Customer is not a person. Customer is a role of person. It's a role that the, a person plays towards the organization. And more precisely, it's a role that a, that a person plays towards the organization in a special department. Because if you walk into a bank and you ask the financial collections department, the investment department, and the credit department what the customer means for them, you get three entirely different answers. These are three entirely different customer records. But, but that's, that's the meaning of expectation. You you simply take it away from the uh, old paradigm like that. It's, it's a little bit uh, harsh, isn't it? No, it's not a hard. Foundation. It's reality. Object or, uh, inheritance does not work for business objects. I, I can't believe that it does because I can always, I've always been able to circumvent it. But what about the interface? Interfaces are good. Yeah, but how we can... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we get into it. Interfaces are good. We're going to we're coming to this right now. Okay. So data entities, data entities are plain classes. You modify them, you never inherit, because it it's causing all sorts of troubles and it's making assumptions that you're using object-oriented language, which you probably aren't. Right? Try to try to deal with real objects using a language that's sort of object-oriented, such as JavaScript. Always think that you want to write a super cool. Ajax application with all the bells and whistles, right? Imagine you want to you want to build the the absolutely cool I make Google Maps look old kind of applications using JavaScript, and that's your client app. This is what you need to keep in mind because you're you need to try if you're building those apps, you need to try to keep your own life easy, and you're doing this by keeping things simple, and that's one way to keep things simple. So define schema that way. How do you express policy? I don't want to go like the word policy, but uh, rules about the, the data structure that come in. 
So whether something is, I'm not talking about just knowledge. Okay. Range of numbers. There are things that you can express in XSD and you can't. Yeah. So where do you put it here? In the validation, in the center of the property, outside? So, I would, I would, I would, you, so you put it it's in, in It's an impact. So, so, the, 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 so the question is, where do, you, where do you put the validation code? Yeah. That's one thing I'm thinking hard about. Uh, one thing I already know is that schema is not the right place for it. Because, because the, and the, re the reason for that is very simple. Schema validation is dog slow, A. Nobody does it, um, so I can't, it, I can't trust in it. Tools are automatically emitted, and so the innocent, the innocent VB programmer will not even know about the existence of a rule like this. Because the innocent VB program doesn't read the schema, right? He imports the schema, um, and the innocent Java programmer also doesn't. And all tools are alike in that they are not following those restrictions. So that's probably bad. Schema validation is something you have to build yourself, and that's awfully hard. So the innocent VB programmer will do that. Will will not do that either. So I'm suggesting a very simple way, and that is no write some documentation. Documentation? Yeah, I'd say documentation. Don't be so shocked. Yes. <laughs> documentation cannot emit code that validates. No, I don't want you to emit code that validates. I want you to write code that validates because of your damn job. Yeah. Oh, he's a marketing guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is... You've, you've, you've written some kind of an aspect for WinForms, do you remember? Yeah, 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 I know, I remember what I wrote. Huh? And that's good, see, see, that's good. Okay, I could, what I could do, what I wanted an aspect on okay. that. Okay, what you, want, what you want, what you want is uh, that. Yes. Do you want that too? And inside, and regular expressions. Would, would, would that be okay? Would, yeah. Do you want that? No. Okay, I have an extension library for this. Will you pay? No, no because it's not, uh, you know, you didn't make it before with the DSL, but we'll open it now. So. No, no, I, can, I, can, I actually have something that works like this where you can throw in the structure and we'll validate that structure. Okay. The problem with that is so... In one month, you, you will... You will you are, you quiet <laughs> are you quiet now? Are you quiet now? What I'm... See, I can... He's not a customer, so... Um, so so the, prob the, problem, the problem is I can validate field by field and express that in schema. As soon as it comes to correlated values, like this value must be between this or this value, or this value must be greater than this value, I come into the, play, into the place of rules. And this is where schema fails horribly. We would have to use RelaxNG or Schematron, which can do that, for the schema language, and then emit another schema, but, do, but where do I place it? In the whistle, or where, and where do I get the Schematron and RelaxNG processors and all of this? So my suggestion for the moment is write some documentation. Shh. I have another question. <laughs> Can you relate fields and the rules on more than one field? Say if that rule is, uh, if that field is in value of that and that field is in another value, then this field can be only on those values. Yes. Good. I, so I have this program. Okay. Okay. So you could. I have a bunch of extensions that actually do this, right? Um, and anybody who's willing to pay a lot of money for it, will make it cheap. Ahi, two hundred fifty thousand. You. That matters because you still have problems with the order. <laughs> actually, see, it's just a matter. If you, now that you say it. I can just put a field in and say process order one, two, three, four, five, and that's fine. We've we've been doing this for a long time. We we know how those systems sort of uh, sort of systems balance out, so that's no problem. All right. Before I lose too much time, this is how data works. This is my my personal my personal definitive guidance. Right. So this scopes it. It's my guidance, not everybody else's my guidance. This is how I do stuff. Contract. Every single thing that I expose from my application has a contract, and the contract looks like this. And I have to go this from the bottom to top. 
That here is contract. I catalog update. It is an interface. Interfaces are pure goodness. This contains the exact same information as a WSDL file. Exactly the same. This here is your port type. This here is your operation. This here is your input message. It's even called message. I have a data structure for that. This here is your output message, which are all defined in schema and which happen to reference data that I'm defining in the data namespace. So these are my catalog items that come from the data namespace. Okay? So every single contract consists of an interface. And so at this point, I'm not talking about web services specifically yet. It has, it has clear alignment with web services, but I'm not speaking about web services specifically yet. I have a namespace for every contract. The contract consists of a set of messages, an input message for every operation, an output message for every operation. If, the, if that operation is request response, one input message and no output messages if the message if the if the message is one way, right? Um, and all of and of course the inter interface declaration. All of these things sit in a specialized namespace for that contract. I'm getting there. Don't be so nosy. Duplex is hard to do in if you're not using any though, right? But you know you already know how duplex looks. Right? It's two interfaces. I can't mark this up here, but I have two interfaces sitting in the same file. So that's so that's what I'm that's what I'm doing for the contracts. Now, for instance, catalog item here. To, so to explain the distinction between the data namespace and the contract namespace. Contract is everything I need to do to get those operations going. And the operations I have on this part in this particular thing here is Create update catalog item, which creates or updates a catalog item. And I have add rating for catalog item, which is a one-way operation. Right? I don't need to know whether that ha whether that worked. That's the job of my infrastructure to make sure that that works. And update item, catalog item stats, which is also uh, just uh, a one-way operation. These are operations which I can wonderfully use through a message queue. Where is he? But, but if you're not using message queue, you should be able to, uh, to validate that nobody does a one way on add rating for catalog item and then calls update catalog item stats on an item that was not already added. Because maybe the add takes too much time and in parallel you get the update catalog. No, no, update add rating is orthogonal to update catalog item stats. No. Oh, you mean? In general, if you have an add and an update, you need to enforce. Yeah, they all, the go, all go through the same queue. But if you have... Items. All that stuff goes through the same queue, so the orders... So you're using a queue to validate. Uh, no, I'm using a queue to actually put order into, a, uh, into any calls. There's guaranteed, there's guaranteed order yeah. even if they're unrelated calls. And even if they're, because I use one input queue. Yeah. I thought of that. So, so there's, so there's, there's, there's interfaces, and every method here has an input message and an output message. And as you can see here, this is already the sophisticated version of this, right? I put a version of, I put a region in here. Here's my region element, which you can't really see unless I start editing it. So, so this is my region, and this contains the more sophisticated any element, any element. Right, so this is what I, what I explained to you, and because I'm using the region, it comes nicely collapsed when I open the editor, and that's exactly what I want. And then I have, for instance, here the update catalog item stats message, and as you can see, it's always the same thing. Here I'm missing the XML type. See, that's a bug. 
but I'm under source control, so I can I can fix this. So it's always this XML type, XML root, serializable. It has the extension of it. It's all the same. It's always the same pattern. You can create a template for this. I actually have a template in in uh, Code Rush that lets me do this. You can also create this in Visual Studio 2005 and just create a message template and then just say one, two, three, MSGs, tab, and then you'll have it all there and you just only need to fill it out. Code snippet? Code snippet. Yeah, you can create a code snippet for that. So all of these things look the same. If we look at any of those contracts in any of those um, sub-projects, they all look the same. So here we have, again, messages and those interfaces. When did I start? At 2, right? No, at 2.15, I believe. Okay. So we have data namespace, contract namespace. All in proper order, all like this. Why am I using interfaces? Because interfaces are uh, more versatile than using WSGL files. WSGL files are good for web services, right? The WSGL files are not good for much anything else. And there are paths where I want to use something else, like enterprise services. In our particular example here, where I want to use the message queue, where I want to use other type of structures, and the WSGL file is not the thing to define those. And a whistle file is frankly not the thing to write by hand because it's just damn difficult. And so this is my alternative to writing a whistle file. Because it turns out that the whistle generator, through my use of the web service binding attribute here, considers this a binding plus a port type plus a set of messages. So the whistle generator can actually do something with that interface. And that's enough. So how do I turn this into a web service that I can call? Here's my web service, and I have a web service here in the WS subdirectory. I have a web service that is, uh, let's take the query or the update web service here. So, and the update web service implements just that interface, as you'll notice, it has this web service attribute on top of it, but it's not derived from the web service class because you don't have to, right? And as you'll also notice, there are no web method attributes on those methods here because the web method attributes are inherited from the interface. And they are inherited from the interface only, only ever, if you create, if you put this web service binding inter, uh, attribute on top of the interface. In that case, and only in that case, the web method attributes and all the other attributes that the web service relevant attributes that we have here um, are inherited into the web service and automatically you get a web service. Oh, another web service specific thing that I'm doing here is that I'm creating the parameter style, I'm using the parameter style bare, like naked. So by default goes and, and assumes that you, the soap stack here, assumes that you have RPC type methods. So you have uh, add int a comma int b. Of course you can't take int a and b and just stick them into the soap body because they would be, they would have no home. But instead, it automatically creates a little wrapper around it. And that wrapper is just an XML element that is home to, the, to those two XML parameters. Since we already have an explicit message body structure here, request, reply, I say bare, and bare indicates that I don't need a wrapper. So I'm switching off the wrapper generation by using this specific attribute. This is how, how I control it. Okay? So now, this is causing the, the attribute to live, um, the, the, the message to live inside the whistle. I, I can show you that in a moment. So, here's my web service. The web service class sits, as I showed you, right here. So, and they're all looking the same. That's the web service here, I catalog subscription, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to get to the just in time activation proxy pool and all those things in a little while. So, these are all the web methods. So, 
where does this web service live? Because we're still inside our assembly, right? We don't have an endpoint yet. The way I'm hooking up the endpoints is I have a little web solution here. That's my ASMX services, and here's my ASMX files. I have one web service project, if you will, for all the web service endpoints that I'm exposing using ASP.NET. Now, commonly, when you see ASP.NET, you have an ASMX file, and if you look at that ASMX file in Visual Studio, you immediately get the code behind. So you're implementing straight in Visual Studio. What you can also do is you can do away with the code behind concept. You can say, no, no, I want to expose not that, but I want to expose the class that I'm referencing. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm hosting inside inside uh, inside IIS or inside the local web server here. I'm saying, okay, please host this class. This interaction I'm doing using that file. This is the SMX file, and it contains web service language. And here's the class pointing into my project, proswear.catalogservice.ws, <coughs> what we just saw, catalog update web service. And the code behind doesn't really play a role. Uh, it generates, it, auto, it keeps auto-generating this, this attribute, even though it doesn't point to anything. So if I say catalog update here, and if I go and say view in browser, then hopefully if I didn't kill it, will hopefully go and pull the respective assembly and here we go and here it, it now publishes that class as the web service class. So the web service classes do not need to reside inside the ASP.NET project. They can be imported and simply referenced by the SMX project which simply means that you have an endpoint if you're creating an endpoint to that SMX file. And here I have add rating, update, up, create update catalog item. And if I go, if I drill in, drill down into the details, what you see here is that in fact my create catalog item message. This is, by the way, the, the the name of the parameter that I'm using for the method. That's used as the name for this element here. You see, it's unwrapped. It's not wrapped in a special way. This is my immediate parameter going to the soap body. If I would not use the parameter style bare here, there would be an additional element sort of sitting in between, which I don't need because I have this already nicely wrapped. So this is this is almost how it will go on the wire. Uh, as a matter of fact, these extra namespace declarations is something that are not going to go on the wire um, if you look at it in real life. But so this is the way. It's very simple. It's all simple attributes. And nothing more. And this is rather easy to read. So this is just something that Visual Studio is making. Well, the, the code generator here is making up, right? But this is just about how it looks. It's it's plain, very plain XML representation um, of my stuff. There's no attributes there. It's all just elements, and it's rather easy. So all of the services look like this. So now we have data, contract. How do we get the contract on the wire? Now, how, how, we get this, how do we get this running? There are several concerns about the runningness of this thing. When I start this, when I start the class, just as I show you right now, in IIS or in the local web server here, let's let's assume let's assume the default is IIS. Then this class lives inside the, AI, the whatever the, the application pool process is that I pick for IIS configuring this website, right? It lives right in there. IIS is, has a process model that is highly optimized for HTTP traffic, meaning that it will look, it will look very closely at what you're doing with HTTP and will activate the application when you make an HTTP call to it um, and if you are if you are seen being idle for a very very long time, ASP.NET will think, hey, you're not doing anything, it will shut you down. Also, ASP.NET will shut you down if you do something that ASP.NET doesn't like. For instance, your call takes very long, or many calls take very long. And as soon as ASP.NET feels like you're doing something you're not supposed to do, it'll recycle the app domain as we call it. Uh, 
it'll commit suicide basically, the, the, the process, and will in hopes that the next incarnation of itself is able to handle the situation better. The ASP, that's what the ASP on that process model is. There are several scenarios where that's not appropriate. Where it's not appropriate to have the infrastructure sort of randomly shut you down and start you back up. Instances of that are, you need to fulfill subscriptions. You need to go and notify someone every 20 minutes. You need to do periodical tasks, like you need to do something every 20 minutes. Sort of the same thing. Um, you need to communicate through something, ex through something else than HTTP. So IS can't see you. If you have that case, then, then you're in trouble. Take, for example, our order fulfillment service. The order fulfillment service here um, has a main method that's the runtime. Our order fulfillment service communicates through the Microsoft message queue. It, and that's its primary, its primary communication media. The, the reason is we can't lose orders, right? And we need to survive the day that Harry Potter comes out. And, and since, since, we, since we need to deal with a lot of load, or, or unpredictable load, and since we can't lose data, we use the communication path of, of MSMQ because it does those two things. It guarantees delivery, and second of all, it shields us from the external load. I can tune this thing, so here I have, um, I have reading some configuration data, the number of threads, the name of the queue I want to listen to, the name of the poison queue I want to handle, and I'm writing to the event hub that I'm starting, and I'm creating a message queue listener with the number of threads, and these are the exact queue number of threads that I know that my application can handle on this particular machine. Okay? And then I'm hooking to this a, a message available handler, which I'm specifying my own app. I'm starting this listener, which I'm building, and all uh, messages are starting to bubble up in this message available uh, in this message available handler, and they come in. Now, this application is not triggered by HTTP by default, right? So I can't start it. IIS doesn't give you an ability to start an application just so. You can't say, now go process your, your global ASAX and start up stuff. Right? You need to have an HTTP request to do so. If the, if the HTTP, if the ASP.NET application recycles, it will, what it does is it shuts down and waits for the next HTTP request to come in. So to do this, you would have to have a watchdog who's basically just, just pulling you to, rest to restart your own application domain. So that's a little problematic with ASP.NET. It turns out that Windows has a process model for those things. An alternative process model to IIS, which is doing that job just fine. That process model is called Enterprise Services, COM Plus. Yeah, that old stuff. <coughs> and it's not old stuff. As you can see here, the catalog service has its own enterprise services component and a bunch of components which are built into this application through the way of using attributes and a little installer. So, and that's what this ES stuff is all about. So here we have our order fulfillment service and the order fulfillment service, this little startup thing here, we have, right, is an enterprise services service component. That's the runtime, and that is the service component. Service component means that this component is installed into the COM plus runtime. When I say COM plus, make no mistake, there's none of the complexity of COM involved in this. It's all, you're writing only managed code. You're plugging this into the application server that's part of the Windows platform that's called COM+. It has a horrible name. 
Um, it didn't profit really from its name change from MTS, which is Microsoft Transaction Server, which was also a horrible name. Now it's called Enterprise Services, which is not so much of a horrible name, but doesn't really say anything. It should say Application Services, but it doesn't. The interesting thing is that, for instance, the application server role of Windows Server 2003, which you can enable, does not install MSMQ, which is a great pity. <sighs> what can I do? Nothing. <laughs> Anyways, so that's the service component. What this is causing, this is causing this component to show up in, component, in the component explorer when you install it. And where installing is done using a tool called Rank SVCS or using a special installer. Also, I'm installing the I, I'm, I use the I process initializer. And if I have a component, and this component is installed into a server application, and the server application is declared by, let's look at the application metadata CS file, and here's where I have all the attributes. And here's application activation declared S, activation option server. And if I have that done, this application is going to run in the enterprise services process model, which is rock solid, it won't recycle, it won't do any of those things. Right? And once this application starts up, it looks, is there any component implementing a process initializer? If that's so, it's calling it on the startup method. Which means, this is our main. So this is the first thing that's being called. So, I'm setting up a timer, I'm setting up this, this message queue listener, and I'm writing two things to the event log. First, I'm writing the Emerson queue listener is starting and listening on the following queue. And the second is that a message that the application has started. I'm going to execute those two lines. So let's pick the, uh, the uh, order of fulfillment service, and let's hope that it doesn't crash. As I said, I'm right in the middle of it. Start. And I need to be in the domain for this to run right. But let's see, let's let's see what it did. Let's let's see how far it got. It may have been trying to get uh, somewhere where it shouldn't go. Well, look, the exception manager logs a whole lot of stuff. Damn. So the order fulfillment service has been started, so that worked. And there's 16 active threads. The application instance has started, and now Mayhem comes along. And there's a configuration exception, and it cannot find the exception management application blocks. Oh, there's an old build sitting on this. So in principle, look at those two lines, you can roll all the rest, right? So application is started, and message queue listener started. So these are the, the exact messages that are happening on startup. I just have to make, have a build mix up here. Um, and so that's happening as you start up your application. The gateway into this application is now can now be enterprise services. It means it hosts an enterprise service, now it can talk to this application using DCOM. Because for the order fulfillment service, I need the stable process model because it has a timer and it needs to do periodic work. See, if I had more time, I would expand on why it does it, but it needs to do periodic work. So I need to have the stable process model. I can't afford the ASP that it should, shuts me down ever. I want to control the lifetime fully. So I'm running an enterprise services. In this, I'm choosing this process model deliberately, and I have other services which don't need this process model, so they run an ASP. Right? So I'm making this choice. So to implement the service, I am using the service component. For instance, in order of fulfillment here, let's look at that. Here, of course, I have the contract, and that's the same again. Right? Root type serializable fulfill order message. And down here is my contract. It's very simple. I order fulfillment, fulfill order. Very simple. It's always the same pattern. 
and the implementation of that sits on here. And that's a service component that's also assigned. And then here we have the security role. They have to be order fulfillment users. I have event tracking enabled so I can see what's going on. I require a transaction for everything that happens within fulfill order. So I'm opening a transaction scope right here. Um, I'm making it COG visible so COG plus can see it. And I'm using object pooling for a very special thing that I'm going to explain uh, in a moment. And then I'm going to explain that just right after the break before we go to the illegal. And these are, so I'm making all these all complete again. That's also a detail I'm going to explain. <laughs> and then I'm delegating to my internal implementation. Following the rule, edge, edge code is for the edge only. So all the business logic sits in internal classes. So if I go to follow this one, go to definition, here is my internal code. Which sits in order fulfillment internal, which sits in this, in this internal namespace. Okay, so I have yes. Where should you handle the exceptions in this way? Where am I handling exceptions? Right. In the internal or um, on the edge? I'm handling them separately in the inter in the internal. The the outer code is just there to delegate. A anywhere we have code, just yeah, delegate out. Yes. Other exception could. Depend on the edge type for, that you implemented. I mean, the exception for web service would be different from the exception for the enterprise service or something like this. Um, exceptions don't go out. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm, or, or should not go out. What I'm doing, what I'm doing here, in fact, uh, I'm not quite done with this yet. Um, in enterprise services here, I let actually let the 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 exceptions slip through. In fact, I should be catching them and anonymizing them. Uh, I'm already uh, catching them here in the internals, in general. And here I'm re-throwing them. And in the edge, in the edge, I'm gonna I'm gonna be anonymizing them. I said I'm not I'm not entirely done with the rework yet. So you have to put the catch code in the edge just to. There would be there would be I mean there's already an implicit catch for the using right. But I would have for the web for the web service interface. I would have to. I would have and will be anonymizing. Let's see whether I have done that anywhere. I currently doubt a little that I've done that. No, I haven't. Well, here's actually by intent. All right. Last thing I want to show you before we take a break, and then I'm going to show you some wackier internals or explain to you that line of code which looks a little warped, right? It has its uses. <coughs> it's there by intent. Um, I would like to point out another thing and that is how I handle databases. Database, for databases, I've done the following simplification of this model, which should make a lot of people very happy. I'm using datasets. Datasets and, data, and table adapters. I have, I have rediscovered my love with datasets at ADO.net since .NET 2.0, because they've done a really useful thing. They're supporting store procedures out of the box right. They're creating, an, they're creating an adapter which contains all my input operations, my update operations, everything is where I'm just updating stuff but never get a result set back. They also support, um, so these are all operations that would never return a result set. Right? They're just database operations and I'm, I have everything behind store procedures. There's not a single instance in this entire application where I'm touching the table directly. Everything happens through store procedures. There is nowhere ever in this, and then none of the database have any read-write permissions for any user whatsoever. They are all read-only for any user, except, of course, the DBA. 
the only user who can write or read from those tables is um, the role, the execution role, for the store procedures, and all users only get exec permissions on those rule, on the store procedures. Nothing else. Everything goes through store procedures. Because it turns out store procedures are faster, are a programming interface, and are service oriented. Faster than ad hoc SQL. Ad hoc SQL. Huh? Well, garbage price SQL is what I have here, right? If, if you if you throw arbitrary text at a database, right? It has to build the query plan. If you want to have parameterized SQL, it's called store procedure. And the only problem if you have to support three kinds of databases, uh, for example, is and, and, Oracle and, okay, two, and okay. Write down, write down. You can come up here, yeah, and write down a a simple a simple query. You have two tables, and you need to write an outer join across two. Write me a SQL statement that works on Oracle, on DB2, and on, on SQL Server. Use and hibernate. Huh? Use and hibernate. Very good idea. Object, or object relational mapper, yes? What you want to send people to hell? <laughs> <laughs> NC SQL or ISO SQL, no, no matter what you call it, is a dream. Okay? It's a dream that was dreamt up in nineteen in the in, in the early nineteen nineties when everybody still believed that everybody would play by the rules. Ever since then, the company Oracle has completely ignored the standard. Yeah, but okay. have and since, and since they have, since they have, and all databases have, have developed advanced features, there is no such thing as standardized, standardized SQL. You cannot write an advanced application that performs, that does, that does complicated data, data management with one set of SQL queries. It's impossible to do so. We have this one. Okay. I, I know, but you're not using a single outer joint, no. do you? Right? So what do you do instead? You're building this all by yourself. Oh, why do you do that? It's pointless. I agree, but this so, is the so here we have so here we have a a data ta a table adapter that's specific for SQL Server. And because I'm aware of this, because I'm aware of this, see I'm I never start thinking. I'm looking at the code, right? Now I'm looking at the code. Here I have a SQL data a data provider. Um, there it is. An iCatalog queries data provider. It's an abstract interface. I have one implementation of that at this time which is the catalog query SQL provider, which implements this functionality for SQL Server, using store procedures, using the fastest way I can, I can imagine this doing. If I had to build another way of doing this, I only have to modify this factory, and I can add the Oracle provider straight to it. None of my business code is, is dependent on SQL Server. It's only dependent on this interface, and the concrete implementation of this for SQL Server, which looks like this. Um, it is very, very, very plain. Right? Here, read catalog item. I'm simply going I'm simply going to say, well this is this is even boring, right? Oh this is the eternal one, right? Wait. So these are the copy methods. So here we go, curry catalog. Use the query adapter called read catalog item summaries. This is automatic. This this year the function read catalog item summaries is is uh, uh, created for me. No, sorry, get data is created for me. Read catalog item summaries is my mapper method, which takes the data table and copies this into my internal data structures. So I'm not exposing the data table to beyond this data data layer, right? Everything that comes out of my data layer is what I have to find, all the classes that I have to find in the data namespace. The data namespace is all the data that I'm sending around. The data tables is really something that I'm using to talk to the database. I'm talking to the relational stuff. 
and then I'm mapping the relational stuff out to objects. Whether you do that with and hibernate or something else that doesn't perform is <laughs> is fine is is fine with me, right? Hmm? Oh, I'm, I'm coding. I'm coding it. Look at this. It, see, see, see. There's, there's. You can invest. You can invest ten hours you know, per day doing the mouse thing, right? And that's fine. I will beat you easily coding this by hand compared to any relational mapper tool you could ever use. This, this here, this file, even if it's a little inconvenient, that data adapter takes me 10 minutes to write. It takes me probably four hours to test. But it, it's not hard, right? You take those things, you have, have a list, you have a list of your, of your table names, and you use a, a few regular expressions, and the code writes itself. Why do I need something that is, is trying to hide all the SQL for me and then does automatic things that are, that are beyond my control and uses a dynamic SQL, which the database has to recompile all the time. I don't see the necessity. I think object relational mappers are trying to make something easier, which is so easy to start with, that it's not worth the, worth, worth the effort. It's the pipe dream of object-oriented programmers who think that the stuff should be automatic, and it shouldn't be automatic. You're dealing... The data is the most important thing that you have, and you ought to treat it with respect. And respecting it means you write your SQL statement by hand. Sorry for the rant. But that's that's what I, it's for me. It's the essence of, of the, the essence of data application programming is treat your data right and don't let any any automated crack tool do it for you. About what? Dealing. Dealing is dealing is is. is Cool because you can influence what that does. Right? Yeah, and and Achim and I have personally written an object relational mapper that does more than any of those things that I've seen on the market, right? And we've abandoned the project because because the thing you cannot get the stuff to perform. Once you do a navigation on a link that's one to n, right? Where where you don't know, where you can't predict how big the n is. You're in hell. Because you don't know how to execute that query. There's no relational mapper which can, which can resolve this. If you have a predictability for the size of the end, you can. If you don't, you're in hell. Sure. And then and then what benefit do you get? You write it by hand. It's 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 that's a dream. Alright. Sorry. Sorry for that ranting. Um so this, so so the core, the core and most important thing I would just said is that write providers, write providers for yourself. Yeah, one more question about that. Mm -hmm. So okay, about this SQL and Oracle and all the stuff, it's all will work. Although you, you are not exposing the data sets in the interface. No. Okay. I'm not, and that's not because I could be exposing data data sets, right? Don't understand me wrong. They would be independent, so the data would be rather independent. Even though mixing the table adapters with the data sets right now is a rather unfortunate, so they wouldn't be compatible. But again, I think that the data table data set stuff is something for the data layer. And as soon as I move up the stack, I want to have my data structures because that's the space I define. It is, it is hugely irrelevant to the application what the database guys think how the database should look and how the how the results sh sets should, should look. In, in fact, the way I'm, I'm returning the result sets in this concrete app is denormalized from the way how I actually go and build my data structures. I have, I have result sets which come in flat, which I'm actually taking, picking apart and turning into, into hierarchies. It's a different view, a way of looking at things. Now we're going to throw in a seven minute break and we're going to continue.